Okay, so what kind of emergency care should we be performing at the basic level for shock? <clears throat> um, as soon as you guys are able to recognize it, you guys need to begin treatment. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, okay? Um, you guys need to get in there, and we need to start treating our patients accordingly. Um, we're going to follow standard precautions. We're going to make sure that we have all the PPE necessary um, to deal with the situation, okay? Um, obviously, PPP is, uh, PPE is becoming a big topic, specifically now with the pandemic going on and how important PPE is and the fact that our medical providers nationwide are not getting the PPE that they deserve. This is horseshit, in my opinion. Um, and this has to stop. I'm hoping that uh, you know we are learning from this pandemic going on. Um, but this is horseshit that our medical providers do not have the proper body isolation um, uh, gear that they need to keep themselves safe. That's horseshit, guys. That should infuriate you considering the fact that you are about to enter this field. Okay? <clears throat> we need to control any bleeding. If we can see the patient bleeding, we need to find where they're bleeding and we need to stop it. Okay? Let's plug the holes. Okay? Um, we need to make sure that the patient has an open and patent airway and that it stays open and patent. We've talked about numerous ways on how to do that. Um, make sure that you guys look back over your airway management lectures if you need a refresher on that stuff. And we need to make sure that as a just-in-case, um, we need to make sure that we are maintaining uh, inline stabilization of the spine. Okay, We don't want to manipulate the spine as much as possible depending on uh, the nature of the call or the mechanism of injury, okay? And we want to make sure that we are checking for breathing, respiratory rate, depth, and efforts, along with lung sounds. We want to make sure that we're getting good, equal bilateral chest rise. Um, and then we want to make sure that we can feel a pulse. Um, hopefully, we can feel the pulse all the way down to the radial. Um, if we can only feel the pulse at the brachial, that means that our patient is starting to shunt. That blood is starting to peripheral vasoconstrict. Uh, from our fingertips and starting to move towards the core, which can also kind of show uh, what stage of shock we are in, beginning, mid middle, or end. We're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get into trauma. Guys, we need to uh, reassure a patient, okay? Again, don't BS your patients. Um, if they're critical, you let them know. <clears throat> um, but we need to try to comfort them. We need to try to calm them. Explain to them the procedures, what's going on. Explain to them what we're seeing as far as their vital signs or injuries that are present on our patient. Okay, um, we need to really make sure that we are trying to keep our patients um, as calm as possible. Not necessarily getting them too amped up. Uh, trying not to get them too irritable. Um, trying not to get them uh, more anxious than they already are. Okay, um, we will never. Ever. It's not. This is not just for shock. Okay, <clears throat> this is basically for anybody that calls nine one one. We will never allow patients to eat or drink anything to being evaluated by a physician. Okay, <clears throat> um, we do this because we don't know if the patient, for whatever reason, may need surgery, and these these uh, docs don't want a full belly going on um, right before they decide to cut this patient open for whatever surgical procedure they might have to emergently go into, okay? Um, remember, that's part of your sample, right? That is the L in your sample um, questioning. When was your last oral intake? Make sure that their last oral intake um, is not during the time that you're with them driving in the back of the ambulance to the hospital, okay? <clears throat> Um, do your best to make sure that your patients do not eat or drink anything before being evaluated by a physician, okay? Um, we want to make sure that um, we are going to protect the spine if it is indicated, whether it's just a C-collar, whether we are going to backboard the patient, or if we're going to paste the patient on a KED, and then to the backboard, um, whatever kind of goes on if we need to uh, just splint the extremities or whatnot, um, we're going to do whatever we have to do in order to make sure that that spinal mobilization stays midline and we do not manipulate the spine too much, specifically based on um, the mechanism of injury of our patients um, or uh, whatever traumatic event uh, may have occurred to them, okay? 
Um, and then we want to make sure that we're providing them with oxygen, high flow oxygen at that. Specifically, if we are dealing with shock, we want them on high flow oxygen. Usually a non-rebreather at 15 linnets um, is perfect. Okay, um, And uh, keep reassessing your patient. Okay, guys, so when it comes for treatment of shock, I'm going to make this really easy for you. You guys are going to need to know this for the test coming up. So make sure you guys watch this or uh, write this down. Listen to this video again, whatever you guys got to do. But for us at the basic level, we need to provide them with high flow oxygen, okay? Uh, normally a non-rebreather, 15 liters per minute right off the bat. If we need to support their ventilations, we're going to go straight to the BVM, uh, 15 liters plus, however high up our regulator goes on our oxygen tank. Um, and make sure that we're bagging appropriately, seeing a good adequate chest rise and about one breath every five to six seconds. We want to lay them flat, making sure that we are protecting the airway. Um, we, ideally, we would like to lay them supine. If our patient is um, not comfortable with that, we can still put the patient in a position of comfort, but supine is technically the goal. We want to make sure that we keep our patients warm. We're going to cover them up with the blankets. And I mean really warm, guys, okay? We are trying to help the patient compensate. We do not want this patient getting cold at all. So this means that, um, you know, on one of our hot August days, okay, we cover our patients up with blankets. I don't care what time of year it is, actually. If you guys, as the professionals, the medical professionals in the back of that ambulance, if you guys are not sweating profusely in the back of that ambulance, it is too cold for your patient. I'm going to repeat that. If you guys, I don't care what time of year it is, I don't care either if it's the dog days of August for us out here, I don't care if it's the cold days of February for us out here, if you are not sweating profusely as the provider in the back of that ambulance, it is way too cold for your patient. They need warmth, okay? We will always get ALS, ILS rolling to us. We want to give early notification to the hospital letting them know that we are coming in with a shock patient, and we want to do a code 3 transport, okay, which means lights and sirens um, all, the way, all the way to the hospital. And then please make sure that you guys are reassessing your patient often. Guys, this is where I want you guys to stop in the lecture. I know I did skip quite a few slides, and it goes off of uh, treatments per the specific shocks. Um, I'm not quite sure who actually wrote this lecture, but um, there are some treatment options in there that you guys actually cannot do at the basic level, um, and I don't want you guys to get confused, okay? Um, I'm going to go into the specific shocks as we go into the disease processes themselves as we break them down into categories such as cardiac emergencies and neurologic emergencies and respiratory emergencies. <coughs> um, I do want you paying attention to the generalized treatment for shock, right? High flow oxygen, lay the patient flat, keep them warm, crank up the heat in the back of the ambulance, code 3 transport, alert the hospital early, letting them know that you're coming in with a shock patient, okay? The biggest thing to take away from this is make sure that you guys are um, recognizing the signs and symptoms of shock. Uh, make sure that you guys know the difference between compensated and decompensated. Make sure you guys know the differences in the types of shock that we went over, cardiogenic, uh, obstructive shock, distributive shock, anaphylactic shock, um, uh, hypovolemic shock, okay? Um, take a small glimpse at the actual um, fluid compartments. Again, I don't really hold that to you guys since um, you're just at the basic level at this point, but that will become more significant as you move up. So you guys might want to take a look at that yourselves, so specifically if you are thinking about going to paramedic or intermediate um, as always, uh, thanks for joining me, and I will see you guys next time.